going to Putin, going to Putin. So, you know, my mother's side, they're from Russia, okay? So their, their Bible was Karl Marx Communist Manifesto. So they're from the Stalin, Lenin era. They escaped uh, uh, Baku, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and they came to uh, Bandar Pahlavi, which is right on Caspian Sea, north uh, Iran, and it's uh, a few hours away from Tehran. And we heard stories, you know, about who Lenin was, who Stalin was, who these guys were, et cetera, et cetera. And then here in America, if, if you drop the name Putin to the average person, and let's just say David goes on the streets, there's a man on the street in New York, or he does in Miami. If you ask 100 people who's Putin, they're going to say what? Dictator, he's this, he's that, he's a murderer. He's going to say all this stuff about him, right? Now, you have actually interviewed with him. I don't know how many hours you guys were together. It was a project that took quite a while to do, and four of these interviews were launched. So... Who is Putin to you, having spent one-on-one time with them? How different is it than what we see on TV, how he's portrayed? Uh, you probably don't want to hear it, but he's a son of Russia in the sense that he has Russian interests are foremost in his mind, as, he, as would any leader in, in any country, whether it's the Philippines or Taiwan or this or that. I mean, he is, cares about his country, and he serves it. That's the way he, and that's why he's, he's there, because people feel... That he's there, and it's they talk about he's he's a tyrant, but he wouldn't stay in office in Russia, the Russia that I know, and many people would agree with this. That it, if he was a monster, which is pictured in the West, he'd be out of office because he wouldn't work. They they have this in, indirect democracy, so to speak. The people are not happy, things are bad, the guy is out, and that's what happened to a few leaders. So. Uh, on that point, you know, I, I went at it without preconceptions, like we talked about earlier. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I'd heard all the stories, and, of course, I spoke to people who told me other things. Among them was Stephen Cohn, who became, I became very friendly with. Cohn was, the, I think, the leading Sovietologist in our country. He was studied Russia. He, he gave me, uh, point by point, all the descriptions of these murders and who possibly did them, but it certainly it would be ridiculous for Putin to have done them because the motive would have come right back on him. He would have been, I mean, it, it's beyond, it, the narrative is so poorly constructed against him by the CIA, and it's been a narrative there for, what is it, 20 years now? Mm-hmm. 20 years of lying and blaming everything on Russia. You have, to be in, you have to be a little bit more fair-minded. You have to be open to say that, is it possible that, oh, that Russia has done all this and, and we're the good guys? It's like a good versus bad scenario. It feels like a you know, John Wayne movie. It's not. We're not John Wayne. We're, uh, we have been trying to destabilize Russia since uh, 1917, actually. Well, we sent an army there in 1918, 19, with the, the 16 other armies to take apart the revolution. Woodrow, this great Democrat, Woodrow Wilson, sent the army. Then again, we, uh, we didn't recognize Russia until Roosevelt recognized Russia in 33. Roosevelt is the one who tried, and he reached out to Stalin, and he met with him. He met with him, and he liked him. And he said, Uncle Joe. They had fun together. They laughed. They, they met got, in Iran. They got along. And Roosevelt yeah. had a plan if he'd lived after April of 45, to bring Russia into, the, into this grand alliance that he wanted. He saw UN grand alliance. It was a very, it was a very uh, strong, good picture of the world. England would be US, China, Russia. Uh, it was a tragedy. He died in April. Because Truman came in and he reversed the policy. It was like Johnson after Kennedy. He reversed the policy with uh, the Russia right away. Right away. They had a horrible meeting. Stalin was said, felt that this was, uh, the opening was over. And of course, Stalin is not, I'm not saying he's a, he's, he was a tyrant. That was a tyrant. And he was very, and he was a murderer. And he killed people. But that doesn't change the effort that Russia made in World War II and the sacrifice they made and how they helped us, too. So you have to balance the good and the bad. The people who hate Russia, of course, point to Stalin as the most evil man of all time, worse than Hitler. So they make a whole scenario about him, but they ignore what the Russians' contribution was to World War II. And Stalin, frankly, held that country together at that time. He was a tough guy. But uh, you, you have to make, you, sometimes you have to lie in bed with people like that to, uh, to uh, get what you need. And America has to be realistic about it. You can't be a child about comic book heroes. 
So anyway, Putin is, uh, listen, I spent, uh, I'm limited, I spent uh, four trips, maybe 30 hours with a man. So, and the result, you should see it, I hope you see it. It's called uh, the Putin interviews, it's four hours long. Four hours long, mm -hmm. it was on Showtime, it still is. And it's available on, through other channels too. You can get it probably on Amazon. You can rent it or you can buy it. It's a, it's, he, he answers these questions that we're dealing with today. Ukraine, foremost in his mind at that point, this was 2000, right after 14, this was 16 area. And he, he tells me the whole story from his point of view, even down to who's firing who. Who are the people who are firing shots at Maidan? It's not, it's not uh, pro-Russian forces because they're firing from buildings occupied by the protesters. It's, a, it's people who are sni snipers who are firing at the crowd, killing both policemen and, and protesters. That's the whole point. You cre it was like the same thing that happened in Venezuela back uh, around that time. That's a CIA technique. Color revolution, then you, then you have the violence. The violence breaks out. Somebody's killing somebody, but you kill from both sides. You create the, the, this disturbance. And they killed a lot of uh, cops. They killed protesters, and that kicked off. The, so who did it? Who was firing from those buildings? Uh, there was uh, lots of stories about the neo-Nazi gangs that were coming into Kiev from the west, in, from the west of Ukraine. It's most likely them. I mean, it probably was them. It may have been some foreign mercenaries, too. So there was all that violence is what creates that mood for, uh, for change. So they throw the president out illegally. They don't, they don't have an election. They, they, we install this guy, uh, uh, the one the other that, uh, uh, whoever he was, uh, Victoria Nuland is there yeah. from the State Department. She's the leader of the neocon faction. Uh, and the American ambassador, it's all, it, 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 we, we got the recordings. They're talking about getting rid, and she even says, fuck the EU, because the EU wants to do it more legally, you know. Frankly, France and Switzerland were playing a role here, a very, and Germany were playing a, a very important role in trying to make this a transition that was democratic, didn't, because they were going to have an earlier election. Didn't happen because of the violence. The Nazis have much more power in uh, Ukraine than you think. The United States denies it because they say Zelensky's a Jew, and that's their motivation for saying, well, how can they be neo-Nazi? That's nonsense. Neo-Nazis were there way before Zelensky, and Zelensky had no power. In fact, when he became president, he had to make a deal with them. He had to make a deal with them because they're tough people. They're not gonna, they are telling the president what to do. You cannot change the Ukraine policies. You have the United States telling you what to do, and you have the neo-Nazis telling you what to do. And what, it's, a, it's disgusting that the United States is, condones, it doesn't mention them, doesn't talk about them, but basically condones what the, Nazi, the neo-Nazis are doing in Ukraine. That's what's sick, really sick. So when you talk about all that, Putin is talking about that. He talks about Ukraine, and he talks a lot about NATO. This was back then. He saw, it, he, for him, it's, you're putting my back against the wall. I'm going, you're pushing me. Uh, that you're strangling me. We're surrounding them. Uh, we made the Baltics very aggressive towards them. Sweden, Finland, uh, Poland has been, we put uh, 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 anti-ballistic missiles in Poland. That's horrible. And Romania. And these missiles can be adapted to an offensive weaponry. And in five minutes could be in Moscow. You see, from, from their point of view, it's, it, they, are, they feel the squeeze. You put his back up against the wall, what are you doing? You're going to create a state either where he's going to go to war and he's going to fight back, and he's got the nuclear weapons to do so. They're, they're, they're crude weapons, but they're, they're very big, strong weapons, hypersonic missiles. We have very f refined weapons. We have, we have great weapons, too, but who wouldn't want to be there in that war? It's, it's, it's not a war that makes any sense for the world. And uh, he's push we're pushing their, his, him to the wall. Either that or else we'll get what we want, which is regime change. Uh, bring in some guy like Yeltsin was in 1990 who would work with us, basically cannibalize the country and allow, allow their resources to be exploited. By That's interesting what you're, what you're saying, Oliver, because one of the techniques that was deployed at the fall of the Berlin Wall Remember, was Reagan putting the Pershing missiles in Germany? I and remember it, that. Yeah. And remember, and it really freaked out Gorbachev. Oh yeah. And they went to Iceland, and Gorbachev said, "What do you want me to do?" 
And Reagan said, you should have said yes. And so it, it, you, looking back to the lens, is this kind of that you think uh, what I'm hearing is you see a playbook here? Absolutely. Absolutely. Never changed. The, the neoconservatives have kept this playbook alive. If you remember the project for the New American Century, that was the, the plan to attack all these countries and, get, and clean out the Middle East, first of all. Uh, it was a husband of Victoria Nuland, Kagan, Robert Kagan, who was one of the project founders. You can go up to Robert Kagan and you can go to Victoria Nuland on your board there. Uh, these are the villains. These are the Foster Dulleses and Alan Dulleses of the modern era. They're her and her husband. Uh, yeah, she's a beauty. She's a beauty. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, when I see a face like go. that, it makes me uh, really... And I, I, I voted for Biden and because I thought, you know, the Uncle Joe, the, he mellowed. You know, he can't be as bad as he used to be, which he was for every war America was in. Remember, he was like, he was a cold warrior. He's never, but he never changed. He never, he, he should be curbing these people instead of appointing them to the, she comes from the Hillary Clinton period. She, uh, he's inherited that and he, he let her become Under Secretary of State for that region. And that is a huge mistake. Huge mistake. But show me Kagan, her her uh, her husband. I wonder what they have, what their days are like and what their dinners are like. <laughs> well, there's some. You're describing some very strange bedfellows. And what's interesting, you were talking about. You know, it's an easy connection. One that I've heard and it seemed very logical about Eisenhower's prophecy about the military industrial complex yeah. Oh, yeah. in his departing addresses. He brought it up more than once. Uh, apparently, Kennedy took that very, very seriously or already had predilection in that direction. But then you're talking about the, um, the intelligence, the intelligence community and the ability to get the go ahead. Isn't it interesting that Alan Dulles ends up on the Warren Commission? Uh, what? <laughs> I think you can answer that for yourself. It's like the fox is investigating not, the chicken coop. You yeah, know? it's not really a question. It was uh, kind of a reflective uh, thing. It's Alan, like... Alan Dulles did everything in his power. He, first of all, he didn't have a job. So he was, he was available to come in for every session. None, none of the other uh, members uh, of the commission were able to do that. Dulles uh, supervised, followed that thing. Everything from the CIA was blocked of, of importance. Nothing got through. The, the biggest crime of all was that he didn't even bother to tell the, his fellow commissioners that we had tried to assassinate Castro. He didn't tell them. Mm -hmm. So they didn't even know about our assassination programs when they started this commission. So where are they going to go? They, they, they're in the dark. But they didn't have a, They had an agenda anyway. It was going to be straitjacket was J. Edgar Hoover said three bullets, six seconds, a crazy assassin, uh, a communist type. And that was it. It was closed. That was over. It was, there was no investigation beyond that. Everything had to fit that scenario. So if you enjoyed this little segment from the podcast, click over here to watch the entire podcast. And if you've not subscribed to the channel, please do so. Take care, everybody.